Hello, and welcome to Important Legal Considerations for Home Builders, a webinar brought to you by AIA Contract Documents. Thank you for joining us today. We'll get started after a few administrative items. First off, this uh, education session is being recorded. You will receive the recording along with the PowerPoint from today's session by close of business tomorrow. So again, you will be emailed the recording as well as the materials by COV tomorrow. Here's our AIA contract documents disclaimer. This program and education session and accompanying materials are provided for general informational purposes only. They are not provided as legal advice. This presentation is also uh, protected by U.S. and international copyright laws. I'm going to now turn it over to one of our co-presenters, Susan Van Bell, to introduce herself. Susan? Hello, everyone, and welcome to our program today. I'm Susan Van Bell. I'm an attorney. I'm currently working as a consultant, but prior to that, I worked for the AIA for 12 years as Senior Director and Counsel of the Contract Documents Program. And prior to that, I was an attorney in private practice. Hi, um, I'm Mariah Snyder, and I'm a practicing architect. I have a, I have a small firm where I do primarily design build work in Ohio. And I do about 25% of my work is residential. And then I also teach at the University of Memphis. And I've been teaching construction, um, construction law and building codes for a number of years, as well as the design studios. And I'm happy to talk with you today about these documents. <laughs> Today, we're going to talk about legal issues for home builders in the context of how your contract addresses those issues. I assume and hope that most of you are using written agreements for your projects, but let's talk briefly about the importance of using a current written contract. A contract is essential for risk management because it allocates the risk to the proper party, partly through insurance and partly through the contract provisions that address scope and responsibilities of the parties. Contract law is a changing area, and it's important to use a current contract to keep up both with law and with practice. In residential construction in particular, it's important to know the requirements of your jurisdiction. Residential construction is viewed in something of a consumer protection framework, and so many jurisdictions have their own requirements on things like disclosures that they see as being for the benefit of the homeowner. We'll be talking about that a little further on in the program. Another way to look at the contract is as a way to educate the client about the construction process. I know many of you probably see the contract as of the least favorite part of the project. But since you are dealing with many clients who have never been involved in a construction project, it's important to walk your client through the contract so they will understand what to expect and what they are required to do and also what you will be doing. So you can kind of look at your contract as a roadmap through the project that you can share with your client in a way that helps to educate them. And hopefully that will keep disputes to a minimum as you're going through the project. So all of that, using a contract that properly allocates risk and using the contract to educate the client can help avoid disputes during the course of the project. Now you may be using a one to two page contract with minimal provisions but that may not provide all the protections that you and your client need, and it may not be current with legal requirements. Next slide. In 2021, the AIA published these two documents for use by home builders, A111-2021, which is an agreement between an owner and a home builder for construction of a single family home, and A112-2021, which is an agreement between the owner and home builder for design and construction of a single family home. 
In this presentation, we will use these documents as examples to illustrate the legal issues we're discussing and how we handle them in those documents. These documents are the AIA's first documents developed specifically for home builders, <clears throat> and Marika and I worked on their development. The AIA had already published design bid build residential and design build residential agreements, which were popular, and so we based A111 and A112 on those documents. But they're very specifically tailored to these types of projects. As with all of the other AIA agreements, we developed these documents to delineate the roles and responsibilities of each party and to provide the kinds of contractual protections sorry, that are important to allocate the risks in this kind of project. The documents contain provisions that may never come into play in your projects, but they are there to protect you or the owner if the relevant situation arises. You'll notice that A111 is for construction only and A112 is for design and construction. Next slide. What's unique to residential construction? We'll go into these areas in more detail. This is just setting the framework for the kinds of issues that are unique to residential construction. I'm going to start with the client relationship. This is unique in residential because the client has an emotional investment in their home. The client is probably not knowledgeable about the construction process or the termino terminology used. For example, what's an allowance? The home builder may have to do a lot of explaining and managing of expectations and work hard to keep the relationship going smoothly. I'm sure many of you out there have had clients with unrealistic expectations. Some of this is because of a lack of understanding about the construction process, and we will address some issues related to that. Having a clear and comprehensive contract not only helps to educate the client, but it can help to diffuse some of the emotion if things get bumpy and everyone knows what they agreed to in accordance with the contract. As I mentioned before, jurisdictional requirements vary from place to place with respect to residential construction. Some of this is tied into the next item, consumer protections. These issues can cover everything from the kinds of notices or disclosures you have to give a client to the specific language that may be used to the type of dispute resolution you can go into, as well as other issues. Next slide. So let's start with the key information that a good residential construction agreement should include. Next slide. These are the key items of information that are essential to include in the construction contract, and we'll go into them in detail. Then we'll discuss the scopes and responsibilities of each party and then other issues to consider in an agreement. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to be addressing the issues we discuss in this program by talking about the way we handle them in the A111 and A112 home builder documents. A112 does have a design process, but we're not going to go into that specifically today. We're going to talk about the legal issues that are common to both documents. Next slide. So there, the relevant parties is important to document this. Again, as Susan talked about how we want to help use these contracts to help educate the clients. And so the party representatives would be the decision makers. And if it's a couple, who is the spokesman and also who is responsible for payment? Do both um, parties, both people in the couple have to sign off on every agreement or can one or does a specific person need to sign off? Uh, these are things to know at the beginning to help uh, alleviate problems later on. You want to specify the consultants if they're known, specifically if a, the client comes to you with a consultant such as an interior designer or a landscape architect that they're definitely going to work with. You want to have that in the document itself. And then if there are separate contractors, like if the owner is hiring their own pool builder, you want to know that as part of the document. 
and because the general contractor needs to understand that there might be some coordination between outside contractors or subcontractors. Now, the documents themselves, the contract documents, is more than just the agreement or the contract. It is the agreement, but also the drawings and specifications form part of those contract documents because that agreement is based on what's in the drawings, as well as the written orders, the change orders that are issued after the agreement, and the other identified documents that you've described in the agreement. All of these are the contract documents and what make up the legal scope of what's being discussed and agreed to. Next slide. So statutory requirements vary by jurisdiction and it's very important to get these correct and to understand what they are. There are consumer, in some areas, consumer protection notice requirements or warranty requirements in some places, you have to follow mechanically notification requirements. And then there may also be um, jurisdictional requirements such as sustainability or preservation or zoning or homeowners association requirements. It's essential that you know what all of these requirements are going into the contract. In some jurisdictions, there's an implied warranty of habitability in Ohio, for example, a contractor must provide a written receipt for any payment, and the first payment must clearly state whether it is refundable or non-refundable. Also, a contract must provide a written estimate for the work ahead of time, which is binding for five days, or provide a written notice stating that the homeowner has the right to receive a written or oral estimate. Now, in Tennessee, a uh, retainage must be deposited in a separate interest-bearing escrow account. And also, Tennessee still requires that contractors provide a written notice that they're about to begin work and that there will be a lien against the property until paid, even though this no longer applies to commercial projects. It still applies to improvements on residential property. And then in Connecticut, the notice of cancellation must be attached to the contract and written in a 10-point minimum font and bolded. So you can see how there's quite a lot of variation just from these three different states. And it's important to know that not just by state, but also if there are requirements by municipality and at the neighborhood level. Okay, next slide. The contract time. Um, the contracts include a fill point for the commencement of construction. And then substantial completion is when the work is sufficiently complete so that the owner can occupy the work. And we'll talk more about what that is um, later on in this webinar because that's one of the ways that you can really help to manage expectations because there is oftentimes stress over what, what is defined as a completed project. All right, next slide. The contract sum, for these documents, it's intended to be a stipulated sum, but there's still points that allow you to use other provisions um, if, you, if you want to determine the cost of the work. A cost plus contract would probably need more edits, and there might be other agreements that are more suitable and more specific to cost plus. Now, in addition to the contract sum, you may also want to include allowances, which you can use in a fill point or just attach a list on a separate sheet of paper. Traditionally, examples for allowances include appliances, plumbing fixtures, and others because these selections haven't been made and can drastically change the cost of the work. Uh, since COVID, we've started to see things like lumber packages as an allowance, as a way to manage the risk of price escalation. And it would be interesting to see if this becomes a uh, par for the course um, and becomes standard, or it's just kind of um, happening in this time period. But other assumptions that should be part of this agreement, there's a place to fill that in if there's exclusions or clarifications. For example, you might want to clarify that the price does not include the pool, because we've got that pool contract coming in, but it does include the deck around it. And then the payment process is based on a schedule that's determined by the parties. Um, typically, the amounts would be paid at construction milestones. 
And if there's a construction lender, that it's essential to have them part of this so that the payments can be made in accordance with their schedule and the way that the lender needs the payments to be made. Next slide. And Susan's going to talk about the insurance coverage. Next slide, Hasti. <clears throat> okay, so insurance is a very important topic in construction projects because it's a major way to allocate risks. And risk is often allocated in terms of which party is best able to procure the insurance to cover the risk. And so all AIA contracts do have insurance provisions written into them that specify what kinds of insurance each party needs to carry. And then there are typically fill points to put in the, the limits of the coverage amounts. And that varies depending on, of course, the scope of the project. It's really important to make clear which party is providing each kind of insurance, and that's also important for educating the client. So the home builder coverages that we require in these documents are commercial general liability, automobile liability, workers' compensation at statutory limits, employer's liability, builder's risk, and then there's a fill point for other in case there is some kind of specialty insurance that might be needed for the project. The parties can determine that in advance and fill that in. Um, builder's risk covers damage to the work under construction and employer's liability covers claims by employees not otherwise covered by workers' comp. And then the standard owner coverages would be property insurance and liability insurance. In some jurisdictions, contractors are required to post their insurance coverages and licensing information online with the governing agency so that the client would be able to also look that up online. Next slide. Dispute resolution. You may be rolling your eyes thinking, I don't wanna think about dispute resolution when I'm going into a project with a client but it's really a good idea to think about it in advance and decide how it will be handled. Um, so the AIA documents contain a section with checkboxes to select a dispute resolution method, and the, the checkboxes would be for arbitration, litigation, or some other method the parties might choose. Arbitration is governed, the AAA is the American Arbitration Association. In these documents, arbitration would be governed by one of these two AAA rules, the home construction or the construction industry arbitration rules. Now, when deciding whether you would wanna have arbitration or litigation, there are different considerations. Um, one, advantage, one advantage of arbitration is that you could get an arbitrator who is knowledgeable about construction, which might be better than having a judge or a jury who are not familiar with construction. Um, it may depend on the complexity of the project, whether you think that would be a benefit to you. It used to be that people preferred arbitration also because it was cheaper than litigation, but again, that is not always the case anymore. And so there are considerations to balance there. And then a note of caution is that in some jurisdictions where, you know, again, residential construction is viewed in kind of a consumer protection way, arbitration in a contract is not always favored. Sometimes it's viewed as being, um, perhaps unfair to the client to require arbitration. So that's something you would wanna check in your jurisdiction. And again, the choice may depend on the cost and complexity of the project. Now, most AIA documents require mediation before going to binding dispute resolution, which is the arbitration or litigation. Um, we did not include that as a separate agreement in the home builder documents because typically, before arbitration or trial, parties will engage in mediation first anyway. 
either as directed by the AAA rules cited in the slide or by court order. Because usually nowadays before a court will have a trial, a civil trial, they will tell you to try to mediate the claim first. And some claims in these types of projects may be small enough for small claims courts. So requiring mediation wouldn't even make sense in that kind of a situation. So that's why, again, in contrast to most other AIA documents you might pick up, these do not require mediation. So the AAA rules that govern arbitration, if you select that, um, there are, the choice of those rules is that the home construction rules have certain limits on what types of claims can be governed by those rules. So one of them is, for example, it can only go up to a million dollars in the claim. So if you have more than a million dollar claim, you would have to use the construction industry arbitration rules. Next slide, please. And here's another one you probably don't want to think about when you're going into an agreement. Termination may or may not be rolling your eyes even more than you were at dispute resolution, but even though no one likes to talk about termination and we all hope it won't happen on a project, it's essential to address it in an agreement. So if it does happen, both parties are protected and receive what they are entitled to. We provide three different termination scenarios in these documents. First, there's termination of the owner by the home builder for non-payment. And the bullets there walk through that process. After 30 days of past due for a payment, the home builder has to give seven days notice to the owner. And then if still not paid, the home builder can terminate. If that happens, the home builder is compensated for work executed and costs incurred due to termination. And then there's two types of termination by the owner for convenience and for cause. Termination for convenience where the owner doesn't really need to have any reason is something everyone wants to avoid. I mean, sometimes that can be because the relationship goes sour and the owner thinks they would be better off getting a different contractor. We don't want that to happen. But, you know, it goes back particularly to the nature of residential work where the owner home builder relationship is very close and the owner is very emotionally invested. And then there could also be other reasons. I mean, maybe the owner has financial issues or, you know, some other reason why they might want to terminate the project. But it's rarely in anyone's interest for the owner to terminate for convenience. So even though the contract allows it, we try to discourage it by providing a provision for a negotiated termination fee that the owner will pay the home builder if there's a termination for convenience. Maybe this will cause an owner to think twice about doing it, and at least the home builder will receive something to help make up for the loss of the rest of the job. And then, of course, the owner can terminate for cause for reasons listed in the agreement. We haven't listed them all on the slide, but for example, if the homeowner or the builder refuses to fail, re refuses or fails to supply enough properly skilled workers or proper materials, or fails to make payment to subcontractors, um, disregards laws of a public authority having jurisdiction, or is guilty of a substantial provision of the contract documents, of a breach of a substantial provision of the contract documents. So again, we all hope that termination won't happen for any of these reasons, but it's really important to have this set out because you can see how if there's nothing in your contract about any of this and then you run into a problem with non-payment or if the owner just says, you know, I, I'm firing you and getting a different contractor, it's really important and very helpful to have this all in your agreement so you can look at it and say, okay, this is what you get in that case and this is what I get in that case. Next slide. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the next section, which is really getting down to the work, defining the clarity, the, the scope of work, and the responsibilities. So the, the 
performance of the work um, is com in compliance with the applicable laws, statutes, ordinances, codes, rules, regulation, lawful orders of public authorities, and follows the property and site covenants and conditions and restrictions and the homeowners association requirements. This is why it's so important to have identified all of these jurisdictional rules as we discussed previously, because you want to write down what it is that you have to comply with so that that's all known before the work begins. And then also the work will be done, it'll be supervised um, using the best still skill and attention as I think all responsible home builders uh, do. Next slide. So, but one of the important things to clarify and to really educate the clients is about the contractor's responsibilities. The contractor has sole responsibility and sole control over construction means, methods, techniques, sequences, procedures, and safety. So the owner does not get to dictate the safety rules because the contractor is, um, that is by contract, the contractor's responsibility and also an area of expertise. And so this clarifies um, that the, the role of the contractor. Another issue that sometimes can get uh, contentious is permits and fees. The, the default is that they're obtained and paid, by, paid for by the home builder. And then the home builder provides copies of the permits and licenses and inspections to the owners. But these can get very expensive. I've had a project where there was a $15,000 tap fee uh, for the city water. And so in, it, you need to be clear about who is paying for these because they can vary greatly, especially from municipality to municipality, it can greatly change the cost of the work. And so you can also put this in the agreement as an allowance in case there's fluctuation or there may be a lot of variation. So that's one way to deal with differences in um, permit fees. Next slide. Now, the warranty is that the work will, the home builder warrants that the, to the owner that the material and equipment furnished under the contract will be new and of good quality unless otherwise requirement, required or permitted by the contract documents, such as I do work in historic preservation. And so in that case, sometimes we require old wood or particularly masonry. This is what I find most common is that we go find some historic masonry to use in replacement. And so in that case, it would be specified that the masonry is not new because we do not want new. We want actually authentic 100 year old or 200 year old masonry. And then the home builder also warrants that the work will be free from defects um, and not in defects that are not inherent in the required quality of work permitted and it will conform to the contract documents. Remember how we talked about that at the beginning? So this is the drawings, specifications, and work orders. So that's what the warranty is. Uh, next slide. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the responsibilities of the owner. Financing is an important one, and there is a provision that allows the home builder to request evidence of owner financing, obviously, so you know the home, the owner has the money to pay for the job. And this would be prior to the commencement of the work, you would make a written request to the owner, and the owner has to furnish reasonable evidence that the owner has made financial arrangements to fulfill the owner's obligations under the contract and that any applicable contingencies for funding have been satisfied. The homeowner has no obligation to commence the work until the owner provides the evidence. And if commencement of the work is delayed under that section, the contract time is appropriately extended. Now, the section on owner selections, um, we added a requirement for the home builder to provide a schedule for the owner selections so that the owner will have to make decisions in a timely manner and not hold up the project. This includes 
product and material selections to be made by the owner, as well as items for which the home builder will provide samples. Next slide, please. So there are a number of items of information that the owner must provide. These are essential pieces of information that you will rely on as the home builder. So it's important to go through this with the owner and obtain the information. That way you are protected if something goes wrong based on information that the owner should have provided and didn't provide. Because the documents are specifically for residential construction, we included items such as HOA requirements, covenants, and other applicable items for residential construction. With respect to consultants, the owner provides the services of consultants as reasonably required for the project. Not all residential projects will need a geotech or other consultants. So that's a, different, a difference in these documents as well from a lot of the other AIA agreements where the owner is required to provide a geotechnical consultant. Again, that may not be required here. Next slide, please. Now we'll talk about a few other issues that are important to address in the construction contract. There are other provisions in these agreements that we're citing, A111 and 112, that we don't have time to go into in this program. And those include things such as hazardous materials, access to the site, and other important items. You can obtain samples of these documents on the website to review the full documents um, if you'd like to see the things we're not able to talk within our time limits today. Next slide, please. Owner's rejection of work. This is a difficult topic in this type of project. Undoubtedly, many of you have experienced the situation where a client has unreasonable expectations. The agreement says the owner may reject work that doesn't conform to the contract documents. But many owners are not going to know what that means. You know, what, what exactly is conforming with the contract documents? We know it doesn't have to be perfect, right? So how does the owner interpret that? We, we had a lot of discussion when we were developing these documents on how to try to place some kind of limits around the owner's right to reject the work <clears throat> so that, you know, the, the owner would have some kind of framework for understanding what would be considered to be compliance. So we, we added in that if there's a reference to a standard for performance or quality of the work, the fa a failure to meet the standard is considered to be non-performing. So that way there may be some standard that provides guidance that the home builder can point to and the owner can understand when the owner is trying to assess whether to accept or reject work. And Marika has some examples from the practitioner's point of view of, of this issue. Yeah, because residential is very different from commercial in some of these ways, particularly with commercial bid work, where everything would be spelled out in the specifications, um, with the performance standards, the materials and whatnot. And so in residential, it's there, there's a lot less detail that goes into the drawings. But uh, this is one of the reasons I really like the performance standards. So for example, the NAHB residential construction guides is pretty succinct, but it has a lot of great guidance in there. For example, for interior wall finish, it says any pop, nail blister, or other blemish that are readily visible from a standing position of the surface at a distance of six feet under normal lighting conditions are considered excessive, right? It doesn't mean that if you can see it with a magnifying glass six inches away that it needs to be fixed, but under normal lighting, under normal lighting conditions and yeah, up to six feet away. And the remedy for this is one time during the warranty period the home builder will fix these blemishes and touch up the paint. So it puts some parameters that you don't have to keep going back over and over and over again. 
Likewise, the Architectural Woodwork Institute, under their Architectural Woodwork Quality Standards, they have specific standards of tightness and flushness of plant assembled casework joints. So you can use that if you have someone who's got questions about whether or not the casework is flush enough. Um, and then tile um, might be considered up to up to a 30 second of an inch off is still within the standards. But masonry joints, if they vary by up to if they vary if they vary by a half an inch, they're not within the standards. So using these standards can be a way to push back against clients that have unrealistic expectations, but still hold yourself to the same industry standards and show that you are performing at a high level. Next slide. So there's bound to be change. Oh, back to changes in the work. There's bound to be changes that happen in the process. Um, and the owner, the home builder and the owner may agree to changes in the work, uh, which may change the contract sum and, the, and then the contract time being adjusted in writing or what we typically call change orders. But if there's something that has to be changed and they cannot agree on the contract sum, the home builder gets paid the actual cost to do this plus the overhead and profit for the change order. Now, if the contract sum um, and the, co the contract sum and the contract time need to be equitably adjusted if concealed or unknown conditions are found. So I had a, a project where there was a huge cavity of unsuitable soil that was found when we went to pour the foundations. And we'd actually done soil testing and it didn't show any problems until we dug out that corner. And so we had to add this, we had to fix this by adding massive amounts of concrete. And so because of the way the contract was written, we were entitled to extra compensation because of the changes that had to be made due to something we could not have foreseen. Next slide. So let's talk about completion and substantial completion again. Substantial completion is when the work is sufficiently complete in accordance with the contract documents so that the owner can occupy the work, not that it has achieved perfection or even photo perfection. And this is one of the things, one of the ways you can educate your clients is going through the contract itself and describing this at the beginning before people are too stressed. So when the project is completed enough that they can occupy it for its intended purpose, and the home builder prepares a punch list and the owner gets an opportunity to add to it. And then the home builder also prepares a certificate of substantial completion and attaches it to that agreed list. Now this is really important because the certificate of substantial completion is the, it triggers the warranty periods and the lien periods. So you want those to have a specific date that they begin at, which substantial completion is a nice, clear date. That is when the warranties begin. That is when the lien and the lien periods are all built around that substantial completion day. Then the final completion is when the owner takes over the, oh, sorry, at substantial completion, the owner takes off over responsibility for utilities and insurance because the, the house is now occupiable, it's reached that level. And then when you get to final completion, it's when the final payment is due and after the punch list is complete and the homeowner submits, the home builder submits the owner's releases and releases and liens, waivers of lien. So, it's important that the owners understand the difference between substantial completion and final completion and all the things that substantial completion triggers. And this can help smooth out the whole process when people are very stressed near the end. And then the correction of the work, the home builder upon seeing this with the punch list bears the cost of correcting the work um, and of any of the work that's rejected. You just go in and fix that. And next slide. Oh, I forgot to say next slide. One more next slide. 
Um, let's go to liens. So the home builder, as the theme that we've had throughout this whole thing, needs to be familiar with the jurisdictional requirements specifically regarding liens. Depending on the jurisdiction of your project, governing law may require specific content and formatting within these documents. For many states, the AIA Contract Documents Program has created state-specific forms for consideration. However, it's important to consult with an attorney to determine whether these forms are suitable for your needs. For jurisdictions that do require a specific form, the ACD program has also created a few generic lien waivers and releases that you may consider using. But again, consultation with the attorney to determine the appropriateness of these forms for your use is recommended because some jurisdictions have very specific language that must be in there. And next slide. It's important to remember that a contract is binding and failure to complete comply with it is a breach of the contract. So that's something, you know, you, you sign the contract at the beginning of the project, it's filed away, <clears throat> and then it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. But everything in the contract forms a binding obligation for both parties that signed the contract. Both parties need to understand the agreement and do what they're required to do as it says in the agreement. This is how a contract can help avoid disputes if it is comprehensive and it can help take some of the emotion out of a situation. When you can point to a contract provision that addresses a problem, there isn't much to argue about if the responsible party has complied with the contract requirement. You may have quite a few provisions in a contract that will never come into play but if an unexpected situation arises and your contract addresses it, you will be in a much better position. Now you can see that a number of the things we talked about today are processes that are included in the contract. You know, what Marika talked about was substantial completion and final completion. These are things that may not seem like legal issues, but having these processes written into your contracts means that the process has to be followed and if it isn't followed then that's where there could be a claim or a dispute and that provides really the guidance for um, trying to keep that from happening we don't want things to turn into claims or disputes when i was at the aia i answered quite a few questions in the doc info service which is you can submit an email or a phone call them up and ask a question about a contract um, and quite often someone would call and describe a situation they were in and while we were not allowed to give legal advice we could point them to the provision in the contract that governed that situation and as i said when you execute a contract at the beginning of a project and then you kind of put it away, a problem may come up and you may not realize that your contract addresses that problem. And so oftentimes it was very helpful to just tell someone, go look in, you know, whatever provision of the contract and that will walk you through this situation. So, you know, again, as I said earlier, you might be using a one and a half or a two page document and a lot of the things we talked about today are things that you might feel like, oh, I don't want to put that in my contract. But um, these are all things that we think are vital to protect the parties and to help have the project go more smoothly and also to educate the client. And, you know, if you do have provisions in your agreement that never come into play, then more power to you. That's probably a good thing, but they're there if you need them. So um, that's why we recommend that. Next slide, please. So why should you use an AIA contract document? I mean, of course, we're going to try to convince you to use AIA documents. Um, we've been talking about the two AIA home builder agreements in the context of the issues we've been discussing. And some of you may be familiar with AIA contract documents, but if not, let's talk for a minute about why you should use an AIA documents for the project. 
besides the fact that we've done all the work for you in developing the documents, which you can see based on everything we told you today of what we considered and what we included in those home builder agreements. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm sorry, leave that on history, Hesty. Um, so they've been published since 1888. It's a program that's been around, you know, for a long, long time. And as time has gone, forward, the AIA documents have evolved to reflect practices in the construction industry. When we draft new documents or when we update existing documents, we work with a committee of architects, insurance advisors, um, outside construction attorneys, and then we always send draft documents to the important shareholders in the type of document we're developing. So for example, we sent these home builder agreements that we've been talking about to some home builders to review them for us and provide comments. And so we do try to get input from a cross section of the industry uh, shareholders in these documents so that we're not only including the legal perspective, but also the practice perspective of what should be included. There's a substantial volume of interpretive case law of the AIA documents. Um, and now there's really probably more than 200 agreements and forms that the AIA publishes. Next slide, please. So what makes the AIA documents the industry standard, besides the pervasive use of them, is the volume of case history and precedent established around the language and the concepts incorporated in the documents, such as substantial completion. I mean, that's basically the AIA definition of substantial completion is basically what the accepted industry uh, definition of that term is. <clears throat> With each new re release of AIA documents, the design, construction, and legal professions are quick to compare, evaluate, and educate regarding the changes in the document because, as I mentioned, that will reflect changes in both law and practice. So for an example of that would be, you know, use of BIM and digital data, which of course over the last 10 years has become um, you know, part of many projects. And so the documents address that or sustainability, which is another item that is, you know, used to be novel and now is is widely used. Um, <clears throat> and again, much of the contract language is about the allocation of risk to the party that is best able to manage and control that risk. Next slide, please. So how can you access AIA contract documents? Well, the documents we've been talking about are the ones that were published for residential home construction. Um, I do want to mention that after A111 and A112 were published, we developed a document for remodeling projects. And that's A113-2022, which is the owner contractor agreement for remodel of a single family home. And that one does address specific issues related to residential remodeling. We don't recommend the two documents we've been talking about today for remodeling projects. So if you're doing remodeling, you can look to the A113 for that. Um, <clears throat> there are three ways you can purchase these documents. You can see the link there on the slide. Uh, the state agency specific non-editable document, these are documents where states have come to the contract documents program and said that they would like to have their, you know, usually their supplementary conditions incorporated into the main body of a document so that their users can have it all in one. And so the, those documents were developed and they're available for purchase. There's the one-time use editable document where essentially you're purchasing a license to, you know, for the use of one document, but you have the full software capabilities to edit the document. And then there's the unlimited annual subscription where you can have access to the entire library of documents and forms. 
Um, if you're doing other types of work, you know, you may be home, doing home building. If you're doing commercial projects or other types of projects, there are many other owner contractor agreements. And then there are also project management forms, which includes payment applications, change orders, certificates of substantial completion, you know, lots of project management type forms that you can, that you can access as well. Next slide, please. So in addition to the documents themselves, the AIA provides many resources to help you learn about the documents as well as other issues in construction. Um, you can go to the documents homepage. You can go to the learn page where um, there are many webinars available that have been recorded and are posted to listen to um, and you know, articles and other helpful information. Uh, there's a YouTube channel that you can go to and, and uh, view uh, materials there. And then there, for the questions about the documents, there's the doc info that I mentioned earlier. Um, doc info does not provide legal advice, but they will answer questions, you know, like what kind of document might be best to use for a specific project, or is there a document available for a certain type of project? And then you know, as I mentioned earlier, general advice um, that may apply to a situation in terms of where your your contract might address that issue to help you uh, help you get through it. And then for purchasing or technical support, uh, you can go to the support team that's listed there, and um, they will help you through using the online product for you know doing your editing and document production and. I will tell you the tech support folks are very, very wonderful and patient with helping to walk people through any issues they're having uh, in that area. So thank you very much for attending today. It looks like we have a few minutes to answer some questions. Uh, so we'll do that. And if we do not have time to get to a question that you might submit, uh, we'll send it to our doc info service and we will make sure you get an answer. They'll, they can send you an email or call you if necessary to answer your question. Thank you, Susan and Marika. We do have a number of questions that have come in through the chat. Um, do you mind going over the different kinds of insurance again? Well, I don't want to do it at too much length, but um, as I mentioned, in the in these documents, the insurance coverages that are required uh, for the home builder are the commercial general liability, automobile liability, workers' compensation, employers' liability, builders' risk, and then there's a fill point for if there's some kind of other specialty insurance that might be required. And then the owner has to provide property and liability insurance. Hasi, are, are the attendees going to get a copy of the slide deck or will it be posted? Yes. So all attendees will receive the recording as well as the PowerPoint slides. Okay. And so you'll receive that. So you'll have, you know, what's listed on that slide. And I would also recommend if you want more insurance, more information on insurance, to go to the learn page, I am sure there is um, probably something there that will help to guide you through um, the nuances of the kinds of insurance that might be applicable to a project. Well, and I think that's one of the things that's nice about this contract is that it has um, it has fill point it it has like clues for you for the most common types of insurance that you might need. So they're listed there to kind of help prompt you uh, so that you don't have to remember every single thing that you probably already have. Um, but we've gone through and looked at what is typically used for home builders and for the home building process. And as I said, there also might be requirements in your jurisdiction. Um, I'm here in Oregon and I had a kitchen remodel done a few years back. And um, in Oregon, the contractors have to post on the, the Oregon licensing agency requires that they post licensing information and insurance information. So I, I could look on the website there and see 
you know, what insurance uh, my contractor was carrying. So that's another thing you would want to check out as kind of a jurisdictional matter as well. Here's another question. Uh, please go over repairs before closing punch list versus after closing warranty. Mariah, can you want to take a okay. and and I, Let me see if I can figure out again. cosmetic repairs. So I, um, I'm not exactly sure what the question is, um, but the contra, I mean, you kind of have to fit, if it's broken, you kind of have to fix it. So, um, you know, you can wait until it shows up on the punch list and do that, or you could fix it before. Susan, do you know of any other legal issues that might stem from whether or not it's repaired something is repaired before or after punch list? Well, there is a correction period, right? There's a one year correction period um, where mm -hmm. if the owner finds something that needs to be corrected after completion, um, I think the contractor would be required, you know, within that period of time to, to correct anything that was defective. Right, but not, unless you contracted for this, you don't have to do that five years later. It's very well defined what that con what that correction period is. Right. And that's an important thing that you might want to have in your contract that you might not think of otherwise, you know, that, um, you know, you'd want to have a time frame set on when you need to keep correcting things. Okay, great. Well, that looks like that's all of the questions that we have. So just wanted to remind attendees that, yes, uh, the recording and the PowerPoint will be emailed to you. Um, please do visit our learn page for additional resources, content, upcoming webinars, and also a plethora of on-demand webinars that we have. Don't forget to follow us on social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, um, we do post content there on a daily basis. So with that, if you do have any additional questions after today's webinar, please don't hesitate to contact docinfo at aiacontracts.com. Thank you so much, uh, Susan and Marika, for taking the time to present on these documents. Um, and we wish you all a happy afternoon.